Good evening, brothers and sisters. We want to take this moment to welcome you and to let you know that still at home, we are going to learn together, wrestle with issues together, make conclusions together, and uh, try to see how we can take these things into the real life of African cities. We want to thank you for coming. Please mind your time and also uh, still at home and uh, every presentation will have questions and answers. And uh, I pray and uh, wish you that uh, we make our questions last within 30 minutes, 30 seconds, so that uh, we, take, uh, we take time on that. We have only 15 minutes of questions after each presentation. If you just make questions to last uh, with ma maximum of 30 seconds, that will be good. Otherwise, feel welcome and feel as uh, one of us and uh, feel that you belong here. Those who come from e ECD, SID, WAD, GC, AUA, feel welcome. And if you come from any other place apart from these entities, you still belong here. May God bless all of us. I want to say happy preparation day, happy Sabbath. Uh, we are delighted to welcome you to the Adventist University of Africa, and we hope that you have found your accommodations to be lovely and at easy and there's no problems, and you're happy in Jesus this evening. If you're happy in Jesus, let me hear you say amen. Uh, we're delighted to have you on our campus for these next few days, and three words come to mind when I think about this family, dynamic family conference. I think of the word lab, which means that you're coming into an environment where an experiment's going to take place. I think of the word arena, and in an arena, there's an exercise, a dynamic practice, or some type of challenge takes place. And then I think of the word excite or explosion. When you come together for the next three days, and you, you have really two days, you have the opportunity to learn and expand and then you have the opportunity to interact with one another, ask questions, respond. We believe by the grace of God, we will hear concepts and talk about principles with the family that will ignite you and cause an explosion. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Now I'm gonna ask you, would you stand for one moment, real please, real quickly, please stand for one moment. On behalf of AUA, turn to someone next to you and say welcome, happy Sabbath, welcome to the family conference. Uh, you may be seated. Thank you, thank you. God bless Dr. Briguri, the president. Okay, sit down very quickly. I have only two minutes. Mine is to welcome all of you on behalf of East Central Africa Division. You are right in the territory of East Central Africa Division. Our sisters and brothers from SID, WAD, General Conference, Whatever else, feel the warmth, the love, the beauty of East Central Africa Division. I will also add one more note on what Professor Baker just said, because uh, I have a very heavy vested interest in the university. Uh, Dr. Baker is the vice chancellor, and if you are wondering who the chancellor is, there are some things you have just to do yourself a favor because no one might remember. <laughs> so when you have Dr. Baker and myself asking you to feel at home here, what else can you do? You have no choice. You have just to feel at home. And uh, I want to say thank you very much for the General Conference Family Ministries Department to choose the campus of AUA in the territory of ECD in convening this summit here. I have a lot of respect for my brothers and sisters from SID and WAD, but forgive me for saying that this is the best venue you could ever think about. <laughs> I mean, you have, to blow, you have to blow your own whistle sometimes. Are you there, Dr. Maposa? 
and Dr. Helwick, they are coming. Okay. Tell them what I said, sir. <laughs> and, and for those of you who are probably here for the first time, I'm happy to let you see, start seeing the beauty of ECD. When you look at these kings, if you have good eyes, if you have good eyes, you agree with me that there's a lot you have to start seeing. Because on this very first sight, I have these beautiful children in our midst coming to minister to us from the Maxwell Adventist Academy. I don't know what's wrong with your kids. You're not smiling, man. I'm talking good about you, and you're still, <laughs> what's, what's wrong with you? Smile, so that our visitors can begin sensing the beauty and, and the warmth of our territory. Thank you very much, and may the Lord be with you as we sit here for the next two, three days uh, talking about family and marriage. God bless you. On behalf of Dr. Solomon Maposa, President of Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division, I would like to welcome each one of us in this auditorium and thank you so very much, General Conference, and thank you so very much our host here, AUA and ECD, for making it possible that we should be able to gather in this place. Uh, thank you, delegates from WAD and from ECD and from SID, you could have chosen to do other things. You could have chosen to give excuses not to come here, but you have made it possible to come here. Our challenges are the same on the continent, and we are here to share what our challenges are. May God bless us all. On behalf of the West Central African Division, uh, the president is not here, but he will join us early morning tomorrow. Dr. Eli Wick, I welcome all these distinguished delegates to this great conference. A conference that has to do with the family. And I know that God has a special interest in the family. And that is why when even Adam was driven out of the garden, the family was not taken away from him. And I want to thank the organizers of this conference, especially Pastor Oliver, he has done so well. And uh, I hope that at the end of this meeting, we will go back and strengthen our families. And I want to welcome my delegates from SID, ECD. ECD, I agree with doc, uh, Dr. Riguri. The place is serene, and I, I love the place. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I thank also the staff of this college. They are so friendly, and we give God the glory. I'm feeling at home. And I pray that the Lord will bless all of us. Amen. Amen. Karibu. Welcome to all of you. We are very excited that you have all taken the time, invested resources, and made the trip to come here for this auspicious occasion. We want you to know that this conference began as a Zoom conversation very early one morning for us with our three directors from the West Africa, West Central, West Central Africa Division, East Central Africa Division, and Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division, the three divisions. What is happening here this weekend emerged from the issues that they brought to the table. We at the General Conference did not come up with these issues. And so we're very excited that you're here. We're excited to be a part of this and to participate in what we believe is going to be something that is going to turn Africa upside down Amen. as we make a difference in African families, not just in the church, but in the society at large. Welcome. Some of you have not yet opened your bags, but if you open them, you'll find the program for the weekend. And at the very beginning of the program, why we need this conference, it says, the Hebrew Bible declares in Isaiah 55, 8 
and mine. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The reason we are here is because we want to be like God. We're God's children, and we want to rise higher and higher. Family is the nucleus of society and of the church. When we have strong families, we have strong churches, we have the wherewithal to preach the gospel with power and joy and help hasten the coming of Jesus Christ. For the next several days, we look forward to being together with our colleagues from ECD, WAD, and SID. And at the end of this process, we have put a subcommittee in place to come up with recommendations. So you will be hearing those at the end of the conference. May God bless us as we worship together, as we open our minds and allow the Spirit of God to fill us and transform us. God bless you. Nancy and I welcome each of you to the Pan-African Conference on Dynamic Family Relations. The topic of the family is vitally important in today's world, and it is important that you have come together to consider, discuss, and reflect on this subject within a Seventh-day Adventist setting. As we know from the Bible, God created the family as he brought Adam and Eve together and told them to be fruitful and multiply. It's good to remember that the two institutions God gave us from the Garden of Eden are marriage and the Sabbath. You know, although it doesn't seem like it, Ted and I have been married for more than 42 years now. Time has gone by so quickly, but as I think about our many years together, I am so thankful for the instruction that God has given to all of us through the Bible and through the spirit of prophecy. We have found that these inspired sources, along with prayer, have guided us through the good as well as challenging times, always providing safe counsel no matter where in the world we are living or what circumstances we might be facing. During the next few days, you'll be hearing presentations on a variety of important topics related to the sacred institution of the family. I encourage you to actively engage in these presentations by taking notes, writing down questions you might have, and looking up Bible passages that will lead you deeper into the topic being presented. One topic that is discussed a lot today is that of how to maintain a spiritually healthy family life when both the husband and wife have professional careers. May I say, regarding this somewhat challenging scenario, that it is so important that we let God, rather than culture, guide us. Let's remember that it was God who created marriage, and he wants us to be able to enjoy everything he intended for this gift to be. He wants us to spend time with our spouses, learning and growing together, supporting one another, being there for each other. After all, he himself said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. But when both husband and wife are pursuing full-time careers, especially if they spend a lot of time apart, it makes it very challenging to receive the wonderful blessings God intends for them. Of course, when God has entrusted us with children, how much thought and care needs to be given as to what God requires of us as parents. We only have these precious ones for a short time, and yet what a power is given to us in shaping these young lives for the kingdom of God. I find that thought really puts into perspective the time spent with our children. 
We are given solid counsel on this topic in the spirit of prophecy. Our work for Christ is to begin with the family in the home, writes Ellen White in Councils for the Church, page 61. The education of the youth should be of a different order from that which has been given in the past. Their welfare demands far more labor than has been given them. There is no missionary field more important than this. Now, as a husband and a father, I was very grateful that Nancy stayed home with our three daughters as they were growing up. Even though Nancy is highly educated as a physical therapist, she was willing to put her career on hold in order to do the work that matters most, helping to raise children who love God and others as themselves. When she did work, it was on a part-time basis to take care of our daughters and our home. Today, our daughters, who all have professional degrees, are doing the same for their children. While marriage relationships can certainly bring challenges, it also brings great rewards when inspired counsel is followed. As we know, God's Word, the Bible, transcends time and culture and is applicable in every situation that we might find ourselves. As various important topics are presented and discussed, including those specific to the African context and challenges, I know you will be blessed as you study together, finding God's will for these important areas of life. Now, as you well know, Africa has had a strong tradition of protecting and caring for the family. Do not let any contemporary trends destroy that beautiful African heritage which God can bless. Amen. May the Lord bless and encourage each one of you today and in the days ahead. The Lord is coming soon and it is my prayer that we will all with our precious family members be ready when he comes. Maranatha. Nancy and I welcome each of you to the Pan-African Conference on Dynamic Family Relations. The topic... Good evening. For opening, you shall make use of our theme song. You should have it in your program. <laughs> standing, let us close our eyes as we pray. Our dear Father and God, our Redeemer, 
how precious and how beautiful it is that we can gather this evening in this auditorium. When we left our different places, Lord, we asked you to protect us so that we can make it to this conference. There are many people who have left their homes, Lord, going somewhere, but they never reached there. Some reached there in pieces, but we are here whole. We don't want to take this for granted and think it is human wisdom. But we want to believe that it is your hand that is upon us. It is your love that has sustained us so that we can be able to live and experience the beauty of this Congress. We are not coming here, Lord, for nothing. But we are coming because you have got something very special to discuss with us. And we are here to listen to you as we speak. Father, you have chosen the speakers. You have filled them with your spirit. Bless them as they stand here on this podium to speak. Lord, may they speak words of wisdom from you. And as we listen and interact among each other about this thing, marriage, the beautiful thing that you created from the beginning, when you said it is not good that man should be alone, and so it fit that you can give him a companion, a helper, a friend, a dearly beloved one, a wife. And you bless them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Dear Lord, when you look at this auditorium, you can see that we have truly multiplied. We are many. Father, marriage is in trouble. Help us, especially in Africa, that we can be able to contend with all that the devil is throwing at marriage. The divorces, single parents, and all the other things, Lord, the madness that we find in the families. Help us, Lord. Bless us as we begin this wonderful Congress. And may it be a blessing not only to us, but to our families and the families in Africa. In Jesus' name, amen. This time we'll be favored by a special item by the choir, uh, Maxwell Adventist Adventist Choir. Tu es ta yari kuilinda. <laughs> 
Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel way in the middle of the air. And the wheels were run by faith, and the wheels were run by the grace of God. It's a wheel in the wheel way in the middle of the air. Let me tell you what a hypocrite will be way in the middle of the air. Let me talk about me. Let me talk about you. Way in the middle of the air, Ezekiel saw the wheel. Way up in the middle of the air, Ezekiel saw the wheel. Way in the middle of the air, we will run by faith, by faith. We will run by the grace of God, the grace of God. Wheel in the wheel, way in the middle of the air. It's another big amen for the Maxwell Adventist Academy. Thank God for Christian education. And thank God for our young people. We're very proud of them. Just before we introduce the speaker, we want to take a moment to, to thank our sponsoring institutions. In a special way, we want to thank the Adventist University of Africa. And Dr. Delbert Baker, the Vice Chancellor, who's been so supportive to this event from the very beginning. And we are just delighted to be on this campus. We are just absolutely pleased for the support we've received. We also want to thank um, the divisions who've been supportive, especially our neighboring division right here on the same campus, the East Central Africa Division and its president, the chancellor of the university, Dr. Blasius Raguri, a wonderful friend of many years, a wonderful friend of many years. Well, we're delighted to introduce our speaker for this evening. So who is Ron Dupre? In short, a personal friend, one who enjoys the abundant life because he loves Jesus. So spirit is one of his attributes. After a series of miracles, he gave his life totally to the Lord over 40 years ago. He's passionate about Jesus. He has been active in church work from college days in Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe, 
South and North America, where he now pastors full time. You see that our speaker also has a mind. Dr. Dupre, for those of you who need to pronounce his name, it's like Dupre for the speaker this evening. Dr. Dupre enjoys deep study, especially of the Bible. Since college, he has completed three master's degrees and two doctorates. Actually, he's just completed a third one. He's also finished the thesis for a third. Author and our editor of over a dozen books. He also serves as adjunct professor at four Seventh-day Adventist institutions and has been honored by his alma mater, Helderberg College in Cape Town, South Africa. I, I love Cape Town, South Africa, I have to say that, as alumnus of the year. They're running out of water, but I, I love Cape Town. In fact, due to his research, the Bible Research Institute of the GC, the Biblical Research Institute of the GC, has recognized him as a major global expert in the Seventh-day Adventist Church on matters such as biblical ethics, polygamy in the Bible, the Sabbath, in Colossians 2, as well as on the ancient Israelite festivals. In addition, Andrews University, where two of his books have been used as textbooks on the master's and doctoral levels, has recognized him as the main expert on the fifth and sixth trumpets of Revelation 9. Don't ask him about the seventh. As well as the major pioneer of the study of the Hebrew literature structures located in Ellen G. White's writings. Well, it appears our speaker also has a body an avid healthy lifestyle promoter with the motto of fitness for witness. Elder Dupre has participated in more than 100 races as a runner, race walker, and triathlete. He trained his wife to do the Chicago Marathon and recently initiated a new young adult movement called the F5 Challenge, which seeks to connect with and physically and spiritually encourage young adults which now has more than 2,500 Facebook members around the world. They had their first major event in October 2016, a retreat at the Grand Canyon. Besides the many who did various hikes at this awesome place, Professor Dupre, age 64, with five guys, completed the challenge to go from the South Rim to the North Rim and back, a distance of about 48 miles, which is almost 80 kilometers, including descending and ascending more than two miles, three kilometers, all in under 17 hours. Don't ask him about the seventh trumpet. <laughs> so in brief, in addition to searching the scriptures and sharing the sheer joy of his personal journey with Jesus, Pastor Dupre enjoys spending time with his fun-loving and spirit-filled wife, Linda. God has more than once miraculously spared his life. Thus, he wants to give all praise to God and desires to encourage us to focus on Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, at this time, we will hear from the man of God. After the platform, our members have moved to the main seats, and as they are filled up, if there are more seats, those of you in the back can come closer he has a body, but he promises not to bite. So as you come each day, we encourage you to fill in the seats in the front so that the speakers could feel like you're here to listen to them. We also want to let you know that um, there's also a prayer room, which, and um, we will say more about that during at the end of the conference. But just so you know, we have people that are praying throughout the meetings and throughout the entire weekend for this conference. So without any further ado, let's pray as we invite the man of God to speak to us on a very important topic of the relevance of scripture for contemporary issues in marriage and family. Let's be prayerful as we listen to the word of God. God bless you. On behalf of the speaker, I'm going to ask that you kindly do us a favor and come to the front, please. Those in the back, please come to the front. Uh, it will do him a great service if he could see you up close. So those on this side, come here. Those on that side, come to the front here as we give our speaker support. Dr. Dupre.
Good evening, brothers and sisters. Good evening, brothers and sisters. It is good and indeed a joy to be back home, back on African soil. I'm from Africa, born and raised in that uh, waterless country. Well, the Cape at least, uh, South Africa. Uh, Dr. and Mrs. Oliver, presidents uh, and representatives of the Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division, East Central Africa Division, West Central Africa Divisions, family life directors, administrators, faculty and staff of the Adventist University of Africa, this city set on Advent Hill, special guests as well as all attendees. I consider it a sacred task to speak to you on this foundational topic of the relevance of scripture for contemporary issues in marriage and family. And I should just say, by the way, it was the very day, that morning, uh, Dr. Oliver doesn't know, at two o'clock on the 2nd of January, I sent in the final document, equivalent of about 500 plus pages for my thesis. He contacted me that same evening. Little did he know if he contacted me the day before, I may have said no. Some of you know Dr. Kwabena Donkor, a personal friend of mine, was supposed to be here and speak, but due to unforeseen tragedies in his own family, he was not able to come. And when Dr. Oliver contacted me, I wasn't sure, I'll be honest, about this invitation. I had just completed four months to six months of heavy slogging through a thesis, if you know what I'm talking about. Try and do that while you're working at the same time. It was tough. Fortunately, my conference gave me some time, but I was still pastoring. But the Lord was good. So, Dr. Oliver, you contacted me at the right time. And uh, I contacted my conference president, the president of the Arizona conference, and he said, go for it. And I'm glad to be here. Very thankful to be here. So I'm back home in Africa. But before we continue, because of the seriousness of this matter, I ask that you pause for a brief prayer with me as we begin. Holy Father, before we open your holy word, we humbly come before you, Lord, recognizing our urgent need to be daily filled with your Holy Spirit. We desire the sweet presence and the clear guidance of your Spirit in this meeting so that we can understand the wonderful light that shines out from your holy word, especially as it relates to issues surrounding marriage and the family. For your glory alone, Lord, we pray that you will hide me behind the cross of Calvary so that everything I say will draw each one of us closer to Jesus, the one who performed his first miracle on earth at a wedding feast in Cana. In his name, let all God's saints say, Amen. Perhaps it may be helpful for me to begin with a brief illustration, actually a personal testimony, if you please. As is well attested, we human beings are creatures of habit. It is almost like the homeostasis of the organs of our fearfully and wonderfully made bodies. However, as we all know, change, despite being particularly painful, is often extremely essential. And now for that testimony. I have to admit that some of the issues we're going to consider during this conference, in fact, some of the very things I'm going to be talking about this very evening, are issues on which I have actually changed my mind, changed my perspective, including, for example, the hot topic of abortion. Moreover, as I spend time in reflection, in study of the Word of God, I discovered that I experienced what we call a metamorphosis in my very approach to ethical reasoning. I moved from what is sometimes called the lesser of two evils concept towards uh, being willing to stand for the right though the heavens fall, and by God's grace doing so in a compassionate and Christ-centered way. Thankfully, of course, we have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to 
obey Him lovingly. And if we do fail, we're thankful that we have an advocate to the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, always willing to forgive us when we mess up. In brief, I can honestly attest to the ultimate challenging delight of change as long as we change in harmony with the written word of God. It's wonderful to change. So as we study the written word, it will draw us closer to Jesus Christ, the living word. Now, obviously, when Jesus was on planet Earth, you well know this, he confronted the comfortable views of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Jewish leaders, the elders, as well as the common people. He repeatedly called for change while promising the power as well as providing the power to respond to the Spirit's call. By the way, my hope is that as we sit through this conference, each one of us, please note, won't just sit here to get concepts, to get ideas, but hopefully by God's grace, what we share will personally impact your life and my life. So that you and I, as our Sabbath school lessons are focusing on, upon it, that you and I can become better stewards, better servant leaders, better reflectors of the grace of Jesus Christ. I'll be honest, as I began to reflect on what is called the Brobdingnagian task, I just learned that word recently and I thought I'd share it with you. What is the Brobdingnagian task? It's, a, it's bigger perhaps than a gargantuan task. When I looked at this huge job of re reflecting on issues of marriage and family, especially as it, we see them in Africa, I began to do some research. And, and I thought about it, I reflected on it, and uh, I had to, uh, as I mentioned, I was uh, filling in for my friend, uh, Dr. Donkor. I began to do some research to look at what I could find. I went online, I went to my own library, and I, I had to ask the question, what is the role of the Bible in marriage and family? And you know what's kind of interesting, wonderful? The Lord brought to my attention things I had not expected. I walked into a store just about 10 days ago, and right there on the counter was Time magazine, just came out this year called what? The Science of Marriage, sold at a grocery store in the United States. And then I went into our own ABC, by the way, this is just, a, there's a great interest even in the secular world, I'm going to read to you something from that. I went into the ABC just last week, because you see when my president, Elder Keyes, said, Ron, you can go to Africa on one condition, you don't miss our minister's meetings. So I was down at our headquarters down in Scottsdale, Arizona, last, this just last week, I, I couldn't afford the time. I took my wife with me, and I had her sit in some of the meetings as my representative. <laughs> but as I walked into the ABC, this is what I saw, I saw on the shelves. <laughs> and I thought, wow, isn't this wonderful? I am headed to a marriage and family seminar, and right here on the shelf in the ABC were all these books and pamphlets on marriage. The Love Fight, Mad About Marriage, 35 Secrets, all of these have to do how to help your child really love Jesus. I thought, isn't this interesting? The Lord kept bringing to my attention materials that were out there. Now, obviously, I didn't have enough time to go to all of that. But I'm thankful that our Adventist book centers have lots of materials on marriage. But brothers and sisters, it doesn't help unless we read it, reflect, and incorporate the biblical principles into our own lives. Okay? I, I'm very, Im very impressed that we as Adventists sometimes <laughs> have more head knowledge than heart knowledge. Oh, I should have warned you. Pull your feet in. I may step on a few toes. <laughs> All right. I'm not doing that intentionally. But the reality is that sometimes we talk more than walk the way we should. Think about that as we continue digging here into the Word of God. And by the way, this is not just recent material. About 20-something uh, years ago, I saw this Time magazine. This is from the secular perspective. Notice what it says. Infidelity, it may be in our genes. What does that mean? Well, you know, you can't help it. God made us, oh, well, not God, they don't believe in God. It, this is how evolution has uh, helped us to develop so that we are unfaithful genetically speaking interesting 
And just last year, in January, I saw this National Geographic front cover. I bought it and I read it cover to cover. Little did I know I was going to come to this conference. But I went through the entire National Geographic magazine called The Gender Revolution. Now, some of you thought there were only two genders, right? Male and female, not according to National Geographic. In fact, I've been told, I read somewhere, that Facebook allows you to choose one of 50 different types of genders. Yes. Strange world we live in, brothers and sisters. It's a weird world out there. And unfortunately, some of that is infiltrating amongst us, even as Christians. As I began to do my search, I found out that there are a multitude of challenges coming our way, such as, and I put this in alphabetical order, that's the simplest way, abortion, abuse of children as well as elders, the, the issue of AIDS, cohabitation. It, it's a nice word. When we were growing up, we called it promiscuity. Remember those days? <laughs> Cohabitation sounds like a, a kind way, but, but that's what's happening nowadays. Discipline, the discipline, the appropriate discipline of children. The issue of divorce that is impacting even Christian, even Adventist families. In fact, somebody just wrote to me in the last few days and said, so and so, we went our separate ways. A husband and wife. Domestic violence, especially against women. The issue of the dowry is still an issue, by the way. I was just reading that in my own country of South Africa. They, some folk use this as a, it's, it's a capitalist venture, so to speak. Okay? <laughs> These are all issues, by the way, <laughs> that are impacting us. Sometimes just called FGM, female genital mutilation, homosexuality, infertility, polyamory. Oh, I've got to go back to polyamory. Polyamory is a nice term for an an ugly reality where people claim to love many people. It's again another nice term for fornication, promiscuity. The issue of polygamy, and in my second talk, I will be digging into that a little deeper. Pornography. And I'll just pause here a moment. Uh, when I served in the Michigan conference about a decade ago, I was asked if I could speak on this topic, of which I knew vir virtually nothing. I went and did research. And when I, I, I made my presentation, it was a very difficult presentation to make. Uh, I was able to contact uh, somebody who had actually been a member of my church, who had been incarcerated before I became the pastor there, because he had been involved, he had sexually abused his own grandchildren. And then he began to tell me about the issue of pornography and, and how it's impacted his family. Oh, very sad. And this is amongst Adventists as well, the issue of single mothers and what I call work-related parental separation. You know what I mean by that, right? Okay. <laughs> there's, there's no one single word for that where two spouses in the United States, they sometimes call it bi-coastal arrangement. The spouse works on the East Coast, the, the other spouse works on the West Coast. And, and sometimes in certain parts of Africa, the husband goes to work in the city, the wife stays on the farm. And, and this causes huge challenges for families. Oh, wow. All kinds. And these are not all of them. This is just a smattering of issues that are impacting us. But before you become too overwhelmed with the apparently insurmountable challenges, allow me to share some good news. And by the way, this is good news from a social science perspective. Remember I showed you that Time magazine that just came out? <laughs> okay. This is in the Time magazine. Guess what they said? I quote now in Time magazine. Listen carefully. Indications that a long marriage is worth the slog, meaning the struggle. Okay? Indications that a long marriage is worth the struggle continue to mount. There's more and more evidence that if you stay in a marriage, there are great benefits, such as, listen carefully, studies suggest that married people have, guess what, better health, all right, better wealth, and even, I'm reading from the report, better sex lives. I put it better conjugal lives. I'll continue from the this, this study in Time magazine. And they will probably, when they do die, they die happier than single people. <laughs> this is the secular report in Time magazine. I continue. Moreover, married people have lower rates of all types of mental illnesses. I continue. And also are less likely 
to commit suicide. I'm glad you're taking the picture now because you don't want to see the next one. Because the next one, there is a bit of bad news. According to the report, here it is. The downside, the only real downside, married people, I quote, are most likely to be overweight or obese. And I think we can attest to that. Isn't that true? Because, you know, we sit back and we relax and uh, we enjoy the delicious food that our spouse prepares. Wow. So that's some good news, by the way. This is the secular report. Please keep that in mind. This is the secular news in Time magazine of last month, which was, by the way, yesterday. Okay? That's the latest information that just came out. So, now, I should pause here a moment. I'll leave that on the screen just a second longer. About a quarter of a century ago, I had the opportunity to uh, reflect on some of these marriage challenges and the subtle incursion of secular patterns of thinking amongst Christians, even amongst Seventh-day Adventists. By the way, you know what King Solomon said. You want to open your Bibles? Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. If you have your Bible with you, Proverbs 23, verse 7. We are going to look at a few passages of Scripture because our topic is the relevancy of Scripture for contemporary issues in marriage and family. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Proverbs from the wisest man who ever lived. Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinks within himself, so is he. So is he, all right? Proverbs 23, verse 7, the first part of the verse. Now, based on Ellen White's dictum that right thinking lies at the foundation of right action, the study I did cautioned against the dangers of what I call atomistic thinking, fragmented thinking. Because I found out that there are some amongst us, even as Adventists, who focus merely on the physical and forget that we must look at the whole person. For example, uh, the issue that came up some years ago and is still being discussed today is the issue of how should we or should we promote the use of condoms amongst singles. And the focus has been let's, use, let's promote that to avoid the physical results and sometimes promoting that at the expense of ignoring a holistic view of the human being. So that's one of the issues of the way we approach things sometimes dangerously. Second issue I addressed was the issue of what I call pragmatic thinking. If it works, you do it. But is that the right thing? And so sometimes that's been the approach. I have a friend of mine, by the way, who back in the 1980s wrote an article. And he was a professor. And he wrote an article on the issue of homosexuality. And in his article, he maintained that looking at a study of practicing homosexuals, not Seventh-day Adventists, they found out that the happiest homosexuals were those who were faithful to their partner. The least happy were those who were sleeping around. And so this Adventist professor recommended that the Seventh Adventist Church should welcome and allow Adventists to practice homosexuality on condition they remain faithful to their partner. It was based upon the study of what? Social science, pragmatic study that showed these were the happiest homosexuals. That was back in the 1980s, a pragmatic approach. Second danger. A third danger I considered in this article was what I call the consequentialist mindset. Those who study ethics will tell you it's teleological thinking. And that's very dangerous because you look and imagine you can project what's going to happen in the future and you act out of fear of the future instead of a firm faith in the Father. So I addressed some of these issues and reconsidered them. One more issue I considered was what's called the moral dilemma thinking, which is again an issue that some of us have bought into, forgetting that uh, instead of choosing the lesser of two evils, we go to Philippians 4 verse 13 that says, I can do what? All things through Christ. That's right. We've forgotten that sometimes. We forget sometimes that we have been called to be faithful unto what? Faithful unto death, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Faithful unto death. Now, that was 25 years ago, I'll admit. And so somebody says, okay, what do you believe now? Uh, from a more study, intensive, extensive exploration of Scripture, what do you believe? And by the way, I want to add a little caveat here. People think that uh, I have studied a lot, but you see, here's the difference. And I want to say this. 
my wife and I, Linda and I, we've been married, uh, I think it's 40 years next year. But you see, Linda and I have no children. So those degrees are our kids. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, you see. Some of you raise children, and I say, praise the Lord. It's much more hard, much, much more difficult, much more challenging to raise three children than to get three doctors. Did you know that? Much harder. I take my hat off to those who raise children because, you see, the children keep coming back year after year, okay, until they're 30, 40 years of age. My doctors don't come back to bother me. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? I can just put them on the shelf and ignore them, okay? But, but so those who raise children, I say, praise God for you. Please keep that in mind. It is much harder, much harder. Don't think I've done anything. I just happen to be, have a lot of free time. No grandkids to look after. <laughs> no children who keep coming home, okay? So because of that, my wife and I decided we're going to spend time in the Word of God. Oh, by the way, I just found out in my preparation for here that Ellen White recommends, says that there are some individuals who should not have children so that they can spend all of their time serving the Lord. I didn't know that. So I'm thankful for this. I have now found theological support for the choice we made 40 years ago. <laughs> ah, so thank you, Dr. Oliver. I, I feel so good. I hadn't known that. I used to always say that I went, my wife and I went halfway with Paul's recommendation. Remember what Paul said? I remain single so I can serve the Lord. And I always said I went halfway with Paul. Now I can say I go fully with Ellen White's recommendation. Because that's what she says. Now, now, if God has called you to raise children, then by all means, raise up a godly seed Amen. for His glory, for His glory alone. Please don't confuse the two. It's just my wife and I felt called by Jesus to do this. Oh, and people say, oh, you don't understand selflessness. You've just, oh, no, we have what we felt we should also do. We opened our home, and for 12 years, on and off, people have lived with us. I counted up the time, and I'll tell you, sometimes it's harder to take those strangers in. You've not raised them. So it's been a challenge. It's been a learning experience, and God has been gracious to teach us many things. As I reflect on the issues of marriage and the family, I want you to notice that marriage and family are under siege. Keep this in mind. In fact, I found an incredible statement by Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. This is what he says, I quote, The current cultural crisis, however, is merely symptomatic of a deep-seated spiritual crisis that continues to gnaw at the foundations of our once shared societal values. If the Creator, if God the Creator, in fact, as the Bible teaches, instituted marriage and the family, and if there is an evil being called Satan who wages war against God's creative purposes on this world, it should come as no surprise that the divine foundation of these institutions has come under massive attack in recent years. Ultimately, we, as human beings, whether we realize it or not, are involved in a cosmic spiritual conflict that pits God against Satan with marriage and the family serving as a key arena in which spiritual and cultural battles are fought. If then the cultural crisis is symptomatic of an underlying spiritual crisis, the solution likewise must be spiritual, not merely cultural. It's interesting. He sounds almost like a Seventh-day Adventist talking about the culture, about this cosmic conflict. Doesn't it sound like the great controversy? I thought, wow, he has captured what we already understood. We may not have seen it in the context of marriage and the family, but indeed, Dr. Kostenberger has the concept correct. Before we go further, anyone who is acquainted with the Bible will rightly recognize that when we go back to Eden, with God's first command to humanity, he identified himself, God, as the moral being, the definer of right and wrong, the source of all absolute truth. Now, since God is sovereign over all, he has provided what we call universal absolute moral laws to be kept at all times regardless of circumstances. Hey, they're codified in the Ten Commandments. These universal principles are given to us to provide us a practical knowledge as to how we can operate. But more than that, it's a practical knowledge of the character and nature of God, our Father, and how we can live in a personal relationship with Him. 
Kostenberger, the one I just quoted at length, says this. In each of the important areas related to marriage and the family, the Bible offers satisfying instructions and wholesome remedies to the maladies afflicting our culture. And I believe, by God's grace, this conference will provide and will share some of those incredible lessons we can learn. And I want us now to turn to these matters on the screen, how scripture is seen on marriage and family. Now, the first three points, as you will see, are ways in which scripture has been, perhaps best word, abused, misused. And I'm going to summarize them this way briefly. Some have essentially dismissed the Bible as irrelevant. They have claimed, and correctly so, that the Bible doesn't say anything directly on issues such as uh, masturbation, homosexual orientation. It doesn't use that concept. It talks about the practice of homosexuality. It doesn't say anything directly on pornography. And some have said, well, the Bible is irrelevant because it doesn't directly address this issue. Others have said, well, they've denigrated the Bible below science because they have said, you see, science has now discovered that there is a gay gene, that people are born homosexual, or they've concluded that the, once the culture accepts it, it's okay, or some have suggested, you cannot contradict my feelings, I know it's right, or as the modern postmodern view goes, it may be true for you, but it's not true for me. <laughs> You've heard of that, right? So these are some of the ways that the, the Bible has been denigrated so that there is no more absolute truth. Others have come along and said, well, the Bible is culturally conditioned. And so we cannot accept this as absolute truth. You see, the argument has gone. You see what Paul was saying about uh, uh, issues such as homosexuality. Paul was really reacting to what was happening there in the Greco-Roman society. Or what Moses was writing about in Leviticus. Moses was addressing taboos of the ancient Israelite nation. These are not absolute for us. This, this is all culturally conditioned. Then some come along and say, well, the Bible is confusing. We don't know what to believe. The Bible gives contradictory information. Ultimately, these folk demolish the validity of Scripture. Fortunately, there are some who display a dependence on the Bible as the revealed will of the Creator God. So this is the position that we as Adventists have chosen, even if and when people turn to us and they say, well, if you believe that, you are a bigot, meaning you are someone who hates the folk who just want to do whatever they want. Reflect for a moment here on a very, very difficult topic. Before we get into the spending a few moments on the Genesis story, I want to suggest or share with you an interesting side issue, side only in the context of it's not from Genesis, but it tells about one of the topics, a hot topic that's hot all over the world, and it's the topic of abortion. Back in the 1970s, early 1970s, in the United States, some of you, if you know the history of what was happening there, Abortion was considered a legally acceptable matter. I think it was 1973. But around the time it was coming forward, the Seventh-day Adventist Church realized that because we have medical institutions, we needed to have some policy to address this issue. We didn't know what to do until that time. And so our thought leaders sat down and they began to wrestle with this whole issue of what to do if a woman would come to an Adventist hospital to ask for an abortion. Are you with me? It was really a challenge. Now, this is more than 45 years ago. So our thought leaders got together, and, and, and I will read to you now. Intriguingly, the, these recommendations to SDA medical institutions selected the translation of the Jerusalem Bible for this matter. Has anybody heard of the Jerusalem Bible? A few hands, right? That's right. After quoting Exodus 21, verses 22 through 25, it was concluded, after using the Jerusalem Bible, it was concluded 
in this document that became recommendations for our medical institutions back in the 1970s. I quote, it is to be noted that the fetus is not considered a human life to the point where life for life was to be demanded. Thus, a distinction is made between the destruction of a fetus and the killing of a person, end quote. Now, I know in Africa this may sound strange, uh, and I'm glad to have seen Elder Wilson encouraging the Africans to, to seriously cling to and hang on to good traditions, because Africa has some wonderful traditions, including the tradition of making sure that the children are raised well. Okay, unfortunately, some Western influences have come in, but there are wonderful traditions amongst African culture as a whole. Now, I know there are multiple cultures, but as a whole. And so the issue of abortion became a challenge. Incidentally, while I was studying at Andrews University, about 25, 30 years ago, I invested about 300 hours on this topic from a biblical and ethical perspective. I had the opportunity as a student to sit in on a special committee that had been convened, an ad hoc committee of the General Conference. I was not a voting member, but they allowed me as a student to come and sit in on the committee called the, the Christian View of Human Life Committee. It was fascinating to sit in there and again, I had no voting ability, but I sat and I listened to this whole discussion. It, it was very interesting because you see, in the 1990s, early 1990s, they were now assessing and addressing what should we do now, 20 years after the 1971 vote, which was specifically targeted towards medical institutions, 20 years later, now the issue was what should church members do? Because members were too asking the question as Seventh-day Adventists, what should we do? And so this committee was sitting together to formulate policy, to reflect on it. Now, <clears throat> the question is, what does the Bible say? I want to go to that text, by the way. I'm going to put it on the screen right here. Exodus 21, verse 22 through 25, which was the text that was used from the, New Jerus from the Jerusalem Bible back in 1971. Notice, though, what it says in this New King James Version. I read, If men fight and hurt a woman with child, so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if any harm follows, you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Sometimes called the lex talionis, the law of retribution. And the reason I'm sharing this passage with you is to make you aware that ultimately there are actually two different interpretations on this passage. And this text has been studied for centuries, intensively investigated, because it's the only specific verse or passage in scripture that addresses the relative value of the unborn in relation to its mother and another man. That's important to note. As I'm going back, I'm using this issue of abortion of many years ago as an illustration as to what happened in, in the committee. Are you with me? And I want to use it as an illustration for, for the challenges that we sometimes face. So please don't misunderstand. I am not attacking. I'm giving you it as an illustration. What happens? This is what's fascinating. Now notice this verse says she gives birth prematurely. This is to a live baby. Fascinatingly, guess what the Jerusalem Bible says? It says the woman has a miscarriage. It's a dead baby. Hmm. One Bible says it's a live baby, the other Bible says it's a dead baby. Now back in the 70s, they selected the Bible that says it was a dead baby. And they concluded that because the baby was dead, a fine was paid for the dead baby. But if the mother died, it was life for life. And on that basis, they concluded that the fetus was subhuman. Now when they looked at the New King James Version, it said something else. And they went back and they studied the Hebrew, and many scholars have considered this. This is recognized, this verse, I quote, recognized I qu as the most critical passage in the Old Testament for the life of the unborn. All right. And it deserves further attention for all of us. Now, interestingly, Dr. Richard Davidson, from his study, says 
this is a live premature birth, not miscarriage, and it's recognized by such by numerous commentators and exegetical studies. The passage shows that, um, before we get to that, I should tell you, I, I found a book by an African as well, published right here in Nairobi, uh -huh, by Hippo Books, 2008, Samuel Waje Kuniop says that this verse shows that the unborn child is what? Fully human. He didn't use the, the Jerusalem Bible. Okay. If you go back and you look at the actual Hebrew text, it's fully human. But so uh, Dr. Richard Davidson, in his uh, book called Flame of Yahweh, and I hope the library has a copy, this book is about 900 pages long. It took about 20 years to produce. It is the seminal study on uh, all issues covering everything in the area of sexuality in the Old Testament. And there are about just a little appendix, so to speak, of maybe 50 pages on the New Testament. It's, a, it's an incredible book. But in this book... Dr. Richard Davidson comes to the following conclusion. The fetus is human and therefore to be accorded the same protection to life granted every other human being. Indeed, feticide, nice word for abortion, is what? Murder. An attack against a fellow man who owes his life to God and a violation of the commandment, you shall not kill. Now, what's interesting, this is Dr. Richard Davidson at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. So in view of the above, the question naturally arises, what then were the results of that Christian view of human life committee, which I had visited? And what is the current position of the Adventist church on abortion? Now, first it must be noticed, and I will admit that in their document, they have scores of Bible passages undergirding their conclusions. Nevertheless, they concluded that the decision to kill the unborn by means of abortion, and now I quote, should be made by the pregnant woman. Interesting. But how was it even possible to come to that conclusion if abortion is murder? Why did they say that uh, it's okay? Question. Now, now, they don't say just do it any time, but why did they say that? Guess what? This is going to surprise you. How had this conclusion been made? And I've checked it carefully. As I said, I sat in on the committee. Whereas in the 1971 policy, Exodus 21, 22 to 25, had been used from the Jerusalem Bible's incorrect translation to support an open abortion policy, now about 20 years later, though the passage supports the sanctity of unborn human life, it was what? Totally omitted from inclusion in the policy. Isn't that interesting? So here's a lesson I want to suggest to us as we begin our reflections here. Be careful to not simply select a Bible version and then to base conclusions without analysis. Are you listening? Very important. Especially when you find a Bible version that supports your view. Be very careful <laughs> because you know how we are as human beings. The heart is deceitful above all things and what? Desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. And lesson number two, do not omit or ignore challenging passages. Very important. How many of you here are studying master's or doctoral degrees? Let me see your hands. I want, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Raise them high. I want to get a quick idea. How many are studying in the graduate school? Raise your hand quickly. I want to get a quick idea. About 20. All right. Here's what I want to suggest to you. Make sure that when you select your team, if you can, that on your team you have somebody who you know will disagree with what you're doing. Are you listening? Uh -huh. Go and find somebody. You know why? I, I learned this many years ago in the 1990s, 25 years ago. I went to somebody and I said to this person, I want you to be on my doctoral committee. And the person says, what do you think you're finding? What's the direction of your thought? What hypotheses have you developed so far? And I began to tell this professor and the professor said, I can't be on your committee. I said, why not? Because I radically disagree with what you think, where you're going. And I said, that's why I need you. <laughs> I need you on my committee. Because I don't want to just have everybody who agrees with me. If you only choose people who agree with you, with you, you may as well sit in your own room and study on your own. We need each other. Okay? We need to have people who can challenge our thinking. Don't simply go and uh, ignore the challenging passages. And that's the way it needs to be as we reflect over this weekend. 
considering the challenges that will come our way. Now, please don't misunderstand. Again, I am not here uh, pointing fingers. I think it is healthy for us as leaders, and that's what I'm speaking to here. We are leaders, servant leaders. It is healthy for us to engage every now and then in what I call corporate self-examination. Okay, reflecting on what we believe and what Ellen White is not afraid of that. She, she, she said, just because something, a policy has been in place or something you believe has been in place for many years doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. She says this, I read, I quote, no true doctrine will lose anything by closest investigation. So let's go now to the early chapters of Genesis. A quick overview. Some of you know it so well. And uh, I just came across this magazine, Signs of the Times, in which it says, the first marriage officiated in Eden by God was a model for all marriages in all future generations. So we want to look at those chapters. And I'm going to share with you a dozen lessons I learned from Genesis chapters 1 and chapter 2. The first issue that comes up from there and you can write them down. There are a dozen important facets. Some of them are overlapping. I will briefly outline. But when we look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 23, very clearly the concept of a heterosexual marriage is in view. It's a husband, and the, the Hebrew word is man there, who gets married to his wife. The Hebrew word is woman there. It's a heterosexual marriage. And we'll explore this a little further later on. The second issue that comes from Scripture as we think about that, and there's a lot more that can be said, is the issue of monogamy. And by the way, in my next presentation, I will be looking at that a little further. I will be digging into it. But we know that even from the language it says there was one man and one woman. When Jesus refers to it in um, Matthew chapter 19, he says, The two shall be one flesh. Okay, keep that in mind. And it's an interesting statement that Ellen White makes. She says... The first marriage is an example of what all marriages should be. God, I quote still further, God gave the man one wife. Had he deemed it best for man to have more than one wife, he could as easily have given him two. <laughs> but he sanctioned no such thing, end quote. That's from Ellen G. White. If you want the reference, it's uh, in the Youth Instructor, Why I, Youth Instructor, August 10, 1899. So there it is. Now, now I, want to, I will admit that the issue, of course, arises. What do we do with the issue of church membership with people who were polygamous beforehand and then they hear of the gospel and they then want to become Seventh Adventists? A matter we will consider tomorrow evening. And, of course, it becomes a little more difficult when you have a member of your church who then goes and marries a second spouse. Generally, the man marrying a second woman. We will consider these sensitive concerns in my next presentation. So I challenge you, invite you to be there tomorrow evening. And please do pray. Tomorrow morning, sorry. Yes, tomorrow morning. And please do pray for me. <laughs> All right. We'll deal with those issues tomorrow morning. Number three, the issue of complementarity. Complementarity. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 God says, it is not good for man to be alone. And so you know the whole story, how God goes from incompleteness of Adam all alone to completeness when he, the Hebrew word is bana, he builds. God aesthetically designs a woman, and Adam is complete. Uh, she was formed to be his, the Hebrew word is his ezer, which is a relational term that describes a beneficial relationship. By the way, I love the way today's English version calls it. It says she's a suitable partner, a suitable companion. The actual words, a suitable companion. The issue of complementarity is there. The issue of equality is there as well. In, in fact, you know this already. Just as that Hebrew word konegdo there is important, one who is corresponding to him. Ellen White says it this way, I quote, Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal. Hmm. Wow. Inspired words. 
This equality, can, you can see in the concept that uh, they are both, by the way, made in the image of God. Both are given dominion over the earth. They are, given, they are co-regents, according to the text in Genesis. And uh, both are called upon to procreate. Number five, the issue of unity is also there in Scripture. Okay, where Adam says ecstatically, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This unity is more than just physical, it's psychological, it's spiritual. Amos 3 verse 3 says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? Implied also is the extension of intimacy. If you dig a bit deeper, you'll see that this concept of flesh, basar, used here, refers not only to your physical body, but to the whole existence in the world. It infers a mutual dependence, a reciprocity in all areas of life. Okay, and Genesis chapter 2 verse 25, where it says they were both naked and not ashamed, implies something similar. There is this beauty there uh, to be enjoyed without inhibition, without shame, without embarrassment, the intimacy. Exclusivity is also there in the story of Genesis. When it says, therefore shall a man leave. Moses is making an intentional point there, by the way, when he wrote this later on. Because you see, in his culture back then, obviously, the woman was the one who always left. But to say the man shall leave implies they both would leave. And they would form their own marriage, their own family unit, distinct from their in-laws. No matter how well-meaning the in-laws are. Permanence. This is an area that we struggle with nowadays. But we know the Hebrew word there is very important, dabak. It's like if you've ever tried this as a child, you take this crazy glue and you say, your parents say, don't put it between your fingers. And what do you do? You put it between your fingers and they stick. And the only way to pull it apart is to cut the skin. It's that concept of sticking together, that permanence which Jesus says, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Privacy is, impl is implied in the leaving and cleaving. And uh, privacy, even when you go for counseling, be very careful what you share, even with your counselors. Privacy is important. Endogamy is a nice big word, but it simply means make sure that you marry within the faith. This is a challenge that is arising all over the world right now, but it's implied if the wife and the husband are counterparts to each other. The Expositor's Bible Commentary says that the woman is to be a partner with a man in both family and worship. So this one flesh concept involves and includes religious convictions. Uh, Ellen White says it this way, that uh, we should not marry someone who has not, I quote, accepted the, faith, the truth for this time. In other words, Adventists are not supposed to marry those out from outside the faith. I once walked into a Baptist bookstore in Nashville, Tennessee. I remember it vividly. And I looked at some of the books there. And I opened one of the books on marriage and courtship. And you know what it said? They said directly, Baptists should not marry Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> and to this day, I wish I bought the book. But I didn't buy it for just that one statement. But I found that interesting. They understood it correctly also. Marriage between... Faith causes so many problems. Of course, marriage is also for procreativity. And incidentally, read the text carefully. When it says in Genesis chapter 2, there's a full stop, a period put there at the end of the marriage issue. Because I am aware that sometimes in some African cultures, if you do not have children, from what I've been reading, you are not considered marriage, married among some uh, subcultures. But according to God, you are as married whether or not you have children. So that's important, procreativity. But also, finally, beauty. At the end of the marriage, at the end of Adam and Eve, at the end of day six, God says it was what? Very good. I love the way the Hebrew says, tov ma'od, extremely good. And the word good can also mean beautiful, morally good, something that's wholesome. Beauty is involved. In the remaining minutes here, I want to touch on and just illustrate what happens on a very difficult issue that is now going global. What would happen if we as Adventists acquiesced, gave in under the pressure of what was voted in my own country more than a decade ago? I believe it was in the year 2005 when homosexuality 
was accepted in South Africa. I think it was the fifth country in the world. By the way, this is my own, in my own library. As I was preparing for this talk, I just grabbed a whole. These are just the books dealing with homosexuality in my personal library. This is such a hot topic. It says huge ramifications. So the question I want us to reflect on, using this as an illustration, what would happen if the Adventist church under cultural pressure, and it's not just cultural pressure, there is legal pressure, by the way, because in certain countries, such as in Canada, if you speak and share what the Bible says on this topic, you may even be arrested. Okay? It, there is danger in certain countries. In fact, one of my former students from Seleucia University, I just read online, is supposed to be called to court, I read. Now, I don't know what he said, but apparently it had to do with the issue of homosexuality. This issue is a huge one. But I want us to go back and recognize that we as a church have 28 fundamental beliefs that are found in our manual, Seventh Avenue's belief, uh, in the left here. And then on the right, we have the book that expands upon it more, uh, which is called Seventh Avenue's Belief. And in this book, we unpack the 28 fundamental beliefs. So today, in the remaining nine minutes or eight minutes here, I want us to reflect on what is at stake. And of course, the question is similarly, if we on some other issue, let's say on the issue of divorce, acquiesce to what's happening in culture, how will that impact the rest of our doctrinal beliefs? Are you with me? What will happen if we bend under the cultural pressure? The first concept that I'm concerned about is the issue of sola scriptura. Both the Protestant Reformation as well as the Advent movement, by the way, were established upon the basic principle of sola scriptura, by scripture alone. In fact, our fundamental belief, number one, based on passages such as Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, you know the passage so well, Psalm 119 verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Based upon passages such as those, we as Adventists have come up with fundamental belief number one, which reads in part, the holy scriptures are the supreme, authoritative, and infallible revelation of His, that is God's will. They are the standard of character, the test of experience, the def Def definitive revealer of doctrines and the trustworthy record of God's acts in history. In short, all other so-called authoritative sources are to be subordinated to the supreme authority of the written word of God. And this includes taking into account the entire Bible, we call that tota scriptura, as well as a settled belief in the unity and harmony of the divinely revealed scriptures. It is evident that as we study the Bible from the consistent witness of scripture, this issue of homosexuality is not some obscure minor point in the Bible that can easily be dismissed. It forms part of the core values of the biblical materials, beginning with God's Edenic model where homosexual acts are clearly condemned, and it's condemned both in the Old and in the New Testament. Now, in the present debate, by the way, there are many who lean heavily on science, even social science, claiming that, well, homosexuals are born that way, and that it is not possible for people to change their orientation. Some studies, though, as we will mention in the last couple of minutes, do indicate the possibility and reality of change. However, even if such studies were not available, the larger question remains, what is to be our final authority, science or scripture, culture or Christ? Are we willing to be conformed to the world or transformed by God's word? Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I'm going to touch on a few other issues that are impacted if we acquiesce the issue of issues that are impacting marriage and family. Our second doctrine that will be in danger is the doctrine of creation, especially the image of God. As you know, God created Adam and Eve in His image. Male and female, He created them. 
And so the whole question about the sexual distinction has to do with what it means to be fundamentally human as God created us. It goes right back to the roots, right back to creation. I get a signal here that my time is running out, so I'm going to just touch on other issues. The theology of family and marriage is part of this whole issue here because as, we were men as was mentioned at the beginning, Elder Wilson mentioned it, there are two institutions that come from Eden. What are they? Sabbath, Sabbath and marriage. And you will notice that they are in the heart of the Ten Commandments. We often refer to the Sabbath in the heart of the Ten Commandments. But the Sabbath is the fourth commandment. What's the fifth? Honor thy father and thy mother. And both of them do not start with the word thou shalt not. Interesting. So the fourth and the fifth. And the fourth ends the first table and the fifth begins the second table. Some scholars say that there's a chiastic structure that they echo each other. The fourth echoes the fifth. Just as the fourth points to God and our relationship to Him, the fifth points to our relationship to human beings. The theology of marriage and the family is going to be affected if we acquiesce to the pressures of the world, for example, on the issue of homosexuality. The doctrine of the fall and the issue of sin will be affected. You see, nowadays you hear people saying, it's the way human beings have evolved. <laughs> this is part of our genetic structure. But actually, if we go back, we'll find out that God created Adam and Eve perfect in the garden. And there was the fall of Adam and Eve. And because of the fall, there is Jesus Christ and salvation. If we do not believe in the fall, ultimately, we will push aside a belief in salvation. Which takes us to the very next doctrine, the doctrine of grace and the power to live for God. And I want us to look at one Bible verse because it's one of my favorites. Whenever I discuss or mention this issue, a difficult issue of homosexuality, I love to go to this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Go with me briefly there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 to encourage you. It talks about the different challenges. Do you not know, verse 9, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Then it talks about the fornicators, the idolaters, the adulterers, the homosexuals. And then verse 10 says the thieves or the covetous. Notice, they're all put together. The covetousness is a sin of the heart. It's put in the same line as the homosexuals. Isn't it interesting? We differentiate between homosexuals and covetousness. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. And I love the last verse, verse 11. And this is what it says. And such were some of you. Past tense. They were changed by God's grace. Oh, that's such a wonderful passage. I have to mention it. The doctrine of the church is at stake. You see, because we as a church have studied this matter, we have come together, and we are looking for ways to reach out to people, to call them into this Advent movement that God has raised up. If we simply allow everyone to do their own thing, we will not be able to operate as a family of God. Finally, just briefly, I want to mention the doctrine of the great controversy and God's character. This is at stake here as well. I mentioned at the beginning, as Kostenberger talks about, marriage and family is at the crux of the issue of the great controversy. I want to end with some encouragement in conclusion. I saw this on NBC, National Broadcasting Corporation. I couldn't believe what they said. This is what they said. Those who do not cohabit before marriage have a greater chance of a successful marriage. <laughs> that was on National B NBC said, yes, praise the Lord. The Bible was right all along. A second thing I came across, and this was by Dr. Harvey Elder, published in a journal. I have the information, if you want that, in Uganda many years ago when moral behavior was promoted between 1985 and 1989. Sexual activity outside of marriage went down. But when condoms were promoted, AIDS increased. Amazing study done by Dr. Elder, who was actively involved in working on the AIDS issue. God's way, friends, is always the best way. Okay? And one more thing to encourage you here. There's been a study done now. I have the book. I didn't bring it with me. It's called X Gays. They have done extensive study. They have now concluded there is sufficient evidence to conclude that chains of sexual orientation is not impossible and that the attempt to change sexual orientation is not harmful on average. And what do you say? That's right. This is studies done by others. I love the way Dr. John Rady, neuropsychiatrist of Harvard University, says it. Genes do not make a man gay. Harvard University, this is what he says. 
This was published in 2002. Furthermore, we humans are not prisoners of our genes or our environment. What are the last four words? Read it with me. We have free will. I love that statement. This is John Rady. And so I want to end with a beautiful statement to encourage us. A statement that comes from the pen of inspiration as we look forward to living faithfully for Jesus. Ellen White says, Christ has given His Spirit to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress His own character on His church. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of His people. Is that your wish? Let us pray. Holy Father, thank you for that promise that we, by your grace, through your empowering spirit, can overcome all inherited and cultivated tendencies to evil so that we can rightly represent our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. We praise the Lord for this presentation. And uh, this is time for questions and answers. This is time for questions and answers. We have 15 minutes. And we agreed from the beginning that uh, let us uh, make questions as at least, uh, if it is long, 30 seconds. Uh, I would like to hear more on the issue of our abortion. According to what I heard, uh, according to the speaker, it depends on the woman who is pregnant. So I would like to know how, if a woman is pregnant and she says, I don't want to have a child. Is it sufficient to do the abortion? What's the view of the church on the issue? I would like to know more on that. Mm -hmm. I will use this mic over here. Um, a very good question. What I will do is simply suggest this. Thank you for the question. The 1992 policy uh, indicates, and I have the complete policy with me here, but the 1992 policy um, says that officially a woman can go ahead and have an abortion. I'm only alerting you to what the policy is. I'm not critiquing it. I'm just alerting you. I'm also alerting you to the fact that the uh, Adventist Bible students and scholars disagree with the policy. So what I am suggesting, since we are in a, in a family conference, <laughs> I am going to suggest to this conference that perhaps, and I've got the family life director right here, perhaps 25 years down the road where we are now, because you remember they first had a policy in 1971, the policy in 1992 um, left out that passage and also did not include Psalm 131, 39 that says, uh, in, uh, that you were formed in your mother's womb, that verse is not there. The only two verses that deal with the unborn were not considered in the policy at all. And I think that's the reason they came up with a policy that was in favor. And I say that having sat in the committee, not as a member, but having been there. There are a few of us who have been uh, urging, reflecting through writing, trying to get uh, folk to think about it more carefully. So this is our church, please notice. <laughs> it's our church, and I'm hoping we can consider what to do. Now, we don't want to, for a moment, for a, please don't misunderstand, for a moment, we don't want to be casting aspersion on anybody. We don't want to speak against those who've gone through a very difficult pregnancy. When I one day did speak about the topic, there was a lady who raised her hand, and she strongly reacted to what I was saying when I was sharing uh, information. But thankfully, brother, 
three or four years down the road, she came running up to me. She said, thank you for what you shared from the Bible. When I reacted back then, it's because I myself had had an abortion. And I did not like to hear what you were saying about the unborn life. But I want to thank God that I have now asked for forgiveness and the Lord has forgiven me. And she actually came to me to appreciate the information I'd been sharing from the Bible. So what I am suggesting for us as a family life, as the Adventist church, since we did reconsider our approach, I think it may be time again for us to reflect on that issue and look at all of the texts. So that's why I'm challenging us here. I actually would like to add to what Dr. Dupre said. I'd like you to actually look at the statement from the Adventist Church, which is much more comprehensive than just a yes or a no. There was a 1992 policy, and you can just go to family.adventist.org, and you will see the entire statement, which is quite comprehensive. So if you have your computer, your smartphones, I'm going to encourage you to go to family dot adventist.org and click on the menu option real answers which will give you a comprehensive um, reading of that policy there's something else that you need to know and that is that currently the seventh day adventist church uh, the biblical research institute ethics committee is reconsidering that statement they're studying it their paper is being presented and it's actually being dealt with right now. So it's much more than just a yes or a no. Uh, for years, the Seventh-day Adventist position has been um, comprehensive in that depending on the health of the mother, whether or not she was raped, there are a number of considerations. So it's much more comprehensive than just yes or no, and go read the policy. Yeah, there are actually seven statements in that policy, from Dr. Oliver White. <laughs> and the last one does say, we encourage all Seventh-day Adventist members to carefully reflect on Scripture and on uh, the principles that come there for as you reflect on it. So thank you. I was not aware that they are considering it in that committee. That is good news. To re and we need to do that. Remember, every now and then we have to go back and look at where we are in our growth as members and as a church. Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate that. I'm ecstatic to hear. Uh, I just want to make a comment. Thank you so much for the presentation. I'm sure you can see me now. Um, the issue is not the scriptures. The issue is satanic influences that are very fast. It looks to me that uh, Anything that is satanic is easily grasped by our people, especially the young people. Therefore, we need to do something very quickly as a church. If we just focus on explaining the scriptures in Hebrew and also in Greek, we may be speaking to ourselves. What can we do to demonstrate the importance of spirituality, the importance of Christianity in our families? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ron. I was um, putting my finger on at least what I would call current um, guideline on abortion as we find it in statement guidelines and other documents. But I'm very grateful that uh, the director made reference to it, and that is very helpful because it, it doesn't mean church has not improved on what would have been an omission. But what really comforts me is that in your clear analysis of what could be improved, 
is that there is a little statement, and I want to read it on the guidelines number one, on prenatal human life, which is a magnificent gift of God. Let me just read a line there. God's ideal for human beings affirms uh, the sanctity of human life in God's image and requires respect for prenatal life. However, uh, I think that's where uh, your major thrust or punch is. However, decisions about life must be made in the context of a fallen world. Abortion is never an action of little moral consequence. Uh, and you see, from uh, an ethical perspective, uh, this is where the major debate is. When is the power of choice going to agree with uh, that, says the, the Lord? And you know, uh, we do have uh, our fellow members, and as a corporate body, we come with these important decisions as, as a guide and with the hope that it will lead us to the Bible. But the major challenge we face is when an individual is sitting in their bedroom, in their sitting room alone, or as a couple, and then they make a decision. Now, that decision may smear the church, but you may not know why they arrived at that decision. And this is where we have this kind of a relative view of certain issues. But I'm very grateful that the church is making an effort and is willing you know, to improve. The last part of that statement says, attitudes of condemnation are inappropriate in those who, are, who have accepted the gospel. Christians are commissioned. But there is a little gloss. I think as we read further, we need to go over that guideline over and over. There is a little on the little two stars there. It's a little uh, section that interested me. This is one subject, you know, from the eth ethics background that has occupied my attention because practically as a pastor, a member comes and says, Pastor, I want to consider abortion. You have to scramble, read, read the Bible, read all this, and the person says, I need an, an honest answer from you, which I believe will be inspired by God. So I think it's, ni it's important for us to resonate, to reason on these issues, to look at them further, study the Bible, keep an open mind, and most importantly, ask God for guidance. I thank you. Do we have a mic here? Yes. I use the issue of abortion only to highlight two points, and I think we may be getting sidetracked. One is that the most important text, the only text that really deals with it, was omitted from our decision making. Are you with me? And my challenge to us as family life educators is to make sure we take the whole Bible into account. When we're talking about the relevancy of scripture for contemporary issues in marriage and family, I simply was using that as an illustration of how we left out the most vital passage. So when we deal with any issue, <laughs> I don't want us to get sidetracked on that topic. The, the overall point is take all of Scripture into account. Don't leave out the ones that may dif be difficult to deal with. That's the point I'm making, okay? And so I don't want to minimize the importance. I do know the point that my friend KK has mentioned here. I had a girl come to me. I was a theology student at, at Helderberg. She was uh, probably about maybe in the 10th year of high school, and she came to me and she said, Hey, Ron, I need to talk with you. I said, yes, she said, privately. She was just a friend. She thought she could get counsel from a, a theology student. She said, I'm pregnant. She wasn't my girlfriend, okay? <laughs> I said, ooh, what now? And she came to me because she wanted to know what to do. Here's the point. To you. We are put into an important role of servant leadership. You follow? But you see, here's what I did. Now, it's a confession. It's an, an, an admission. What had happened, I was looking for what I call the lesser of two evils way out. You follow? The quickie, the quick answer. And I suggested to her, go ahead and get, have an abortion. I didn't address the real issue. Guess what the real issue was? Her loose life that she was living. The real issue was her promiscuity. 
because I recommended to get rid of the consequences of her, of her promiscuity. Two years later, she was pregnant again. You follow what I'm saying? So we must look at the whole person. We must avoid pragmatic, quick answers to problems. We must, and so I was a theology major. That doesn't excuse it. But at that point, I thought, I believed that the unborn was just a thing. You follow? So our theology affects our counsel. <laughs> so that's why I want to say my only point on the issue of abortion is to take into account the entire scripture and to deal compassionately the way Jesus would deal and really address the most important issues without leaving the others undone. Thank you, thank you. I see some hands, but time, time is up. Okay. Time is up. An everlasting gospel needs not to be eternal in its presentation. We need to stop there, somewhere there. Uh, this is time to close up and then have a, a last prayer, and then we prepare for tomorrow morning. We have another long day. Announcements? Yes, okay. Let's give the announcements. While the announcements are coming, I will just let you know that uh, I'm willing to stay around a little longer to dialogue in person. I see some personal friends, acquaintances, former students maybe, and I will be willing to stay a little longer. Thank you. Please let us take these few announcements. We just want to inform you that the washrooms are on all the floors, the levels. First level, the, the ground floor, the second, and the third. Number two, our timekeeping is very important. You will agree with me. Uh, tomorrow, the program begins at what time? Eight o'clock. And whether you are here or not, we are beginning the program. So we will employ you to keep time and, and come over on time so that we can finish on time. Number three, we have a prayer room on the last floor. Um, if you go to the last floor, there are two rooms at the back on this side there. There is a prayer room there. You can go there and pray. More so, we have some people who have dedicated some, themselves to pray for you. And so we have a prayer box behind there. If you have a prayer that you would like this prayer team to pray for you about, please drop your prayer request on the, on the prayer box over there. Number four, and this is very important, those of you who would like us to convey you back to the airport, you need to confirm your return schedule with Pauline. And Pauline will be in the, in the lobby by tomorrow morning, she will be there. We need to have this confirmation before the end of tomorrow. If you want us to convey you back, but Pauline, I see Pauline giving me signal now that you need to do that now before you go to sleep. Yes. So Pauline will wait behind. Please see Pauline and confirm your retained schedule with her so we can comfortably convey you to the airport. The last announcement is uh, that a um, couple of you have approached me that you would like to go to the Nairobi National Park. I'm talking about the Wildlife Game Park. Uh, we have designed a form, and I'm leaving this form again with Pauline. And uh, it says, registration for Nairobi National Park, Sunday, March 4, at 5.30 a.m. Uh, roughly, you will pay about $100 for transportation and for the gate fee. Uh, if you, we need to plan for this if you are interested.